Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about the science of learning with Dr. Gary Marcus. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode number 141, recorded on Thursday, April 26, 2012. Old dog, new science. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford, and this is the show that I hope you have come to know and love as the show where you get to sit back, relax, soak in science for an entire hour. That's right. One hour, one expert, one topic in the sciences. And today is no exception. Sometimes I do make exceptions. Today, we're going to dig in to the subject of learning, the science of learning. And we're not just talking any learning, but the learning of new skills as an adult. Don't you, you don't think you can learn an instrument? Maybe you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you're like, ah, I'm too old for that. Well, maybe this show will change your mind. We're talking with leading professor of psychology, mind and brain, and the author of Guitar Zero, Gary Marcus today. But first, a few science headlines. It's April 26th, 2012, and these are the science news stories that made headlines this week. Was the Cambrian explosion triggered by geologic events? According to a paper in the journal Nature, a gap in the rock record of the Earth's history called the Great Unconformity provides clues to and was possibly the catalyst for the massive diversification of life during the early Cambrian, 525 million years ago. The gist of the mechanism is that erosion as a result of the repeated rise and retreat of sea levels released massive amounts of ions into the oceans for which organisms had to evolve adaptations. And eventually those adaptations would give rise to shells, bones, teeth, claws, and other (laughs) mineralized structures. However... Super, supernova might have been involved as well. A review of supernova explosions within the Milky Way galaxy going back some 500 million years has given rise to the idea that periods of diversification, diversification on Earth coincide with bouts of exposure to regions of increased star formation. Supernovas and galactic cosmic rays according uh, and, and galactic cosmic rays. According to the study, which was published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, supernova activity influences the Earth's climate, making it cooler and more likely to lead to glaci- glaciation. And those climatic changes have a positive effect on the diversity of life on this planet. A company called Festo in Germany has created a robotic hand controlled by a glove called ExoHand. The glove is really an exoskeleton, which is manufactured to perfectly fit the user. User, They laser scan your hand to make a, a glove that fits you like a glove. Um, and the user's hand movements then are detected and transmitted to the robot, allowing precision movement. And a company called Planetary Resources Resources launched this week in Seattle, Washington, with the goal of mining asteroids. Funded and advised by the likes of James Cameron, it seems a bit like a movie plot, but this is real. Planetary, planetary Resources will begin developing space telescopes to scan for asteroids and eventually create and build robot spacecraft for surveying specific candidates. Their first demonstration mission is set to launch in two years. Oh, and they are also currently hiring. In a fascinating example of the resilience of life, Japanese scientists found that insects that ingest a specific strain of bacteria gain resistance to an insecticide called 
phenytrothion. That's right. Bean bugs swallow a bacteria known as Burkholderia, which are capable of breaking down and detoxifying the insecticide, giving the bacteria a nice, safe place in their gut and are rendered immune to our poisons. This study was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. A study published in Nature Physics paints an an intriguing picture of quantum entanglement and correlation between future and past events. Using a technique called delayed choice entanglement, the researchers describe experimental results suggesting that the choice to entangle particles or not affects the results of earlier measurements. I'll say that a different way. Measurements taken at different points in space and time appear to affect each other with no apparent mechanism of information transfer involved. Seriously, the universe just got a little bit weirder for me. And uh, finally, if you were hoping to make a rational decision today, you might consider making it in a foreign language. Researchers at the University of Chicago found that thinking about a risky proposition became more logical and less averse to bias when done in another language. The results suggest that thinking in a second language reduces the brain's ability to rely on emotional reactions. And that does it for the science headlines this week. Let me know what you think about these science news stories or tell me what you think should be news by emailing drkiki at drkiki.tv or leave me a voicemail, 650-741-5454. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means that you save time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. Uh, First, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your computer, your Mac, PC, iPad. They have an iPad app you can watch on your iPhone. There's an app for that. And even some Android phones uh, as well. If you have a gaming console, like an Xbox 360 or a PS3 or a Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV using one of those. And if you're not a gamer, you can also use uh, watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box, which are pretty inexpensive and very easy to use. And with Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. You can begin watching on one device and then turn it off at any point in your show and pick it up where you left off on another device someplace else. You can you can travel all over, watch what you want, when you want, where you want, and how you want. It's a seamless experience, which I personally enjoy. Whichever way that you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many shows as you want anytime and you can cancel anytime. But Netflix is offering you 30 days for free if you're not already using their service. You can sign up, netflix.com slash twit. Get 30 days for free. You have to use this URL when you sign up, netflix.com slash twit. That's right, netflix.com slash twit. Remember that, 30 days free. We thank Netflix for their support of Twit and Dr. Kiki Science Hour, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And now it's time to bring the guest expert for the show into the show. At long last, you've been waiting so long. Gary Marcus is an award-winning professor of psychology and the director of the NYU Center for Language and Music, where he studies evolution, language, and cognitive development. He has written three books about the origins and development of mind and brain, including Kluge, which is a great book. And most recently, Guitar Zero, The New Musician and the Science of Learning. He's the editor of the Norton Psychology Reader and the author of numerous science publications in leading journals like Science and Nature. His essays have appeared in forums like Wired, Discover, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. And he's a member of the band Brush Hour. So without any further ado, Gary, thank you for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me back. You're welcome. So you've been up to an awful lot since the last time that uh, that that we spoke. It's you know? true. I, I I left your door and started playing guitar not that much long longer after the last time I saw you. That's it's really interesting. So why guitar? Why not piano or the flute or you know learn Russian? Like why did you say guitar is what I want to do right now? 
Well, I always loved music. We should start with that. Um, and I always wanted to play music. And there's no way the instrument would have been the recorder because I tried to play recorder in fourth grade and I couldn't play Mary Had a Little Lamb. And my teacher um, decided that perhaps it was better that I follow other career paths. And um, not that I wanted to become a professional recorder player, but I think she didn't realize that I didn't understand that different notes had different durations. And she just sent me on my way instead of maybe practicing me on quarter notes and eighth notes. So a quarter was not going to be the instrument. I tried another thing, which was a piano called the Miracle Piano when I was in graduate school. And the idea of the Miracle Piano is was a typing tutor, basically, that you would hook up to your Macintosh. And I got through the first five lessons, no problem. I was able to learn where the notes are and all these kinds of things and the sequence of notes that I was supposed to play on the song that might possibly have been Mary Had a Little Lamb, for all I know. And then it got to the point where you had to uh, understand rhythm and I just didn't get it. I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. I couldn't match the timing of the program. So I gave up on that. There were no miracles with the miracle piano. And I had a few other uh, attempts here and there. Dan Levitin um, of This Is Your Brain on Music tried to teach me a little bit of guitar and nothing really seemed to work. And then a colleague of mine said that I should try playing Guitar Hero and that it would be really fun. And I, I bought the game and it wasn't fun at all. I, I um, discovered that what happens is it's the dumbest game in the world, I have to say. A bunch of dots come from the top of the screen, they move down, and then you have to press the button at the right time. And I was playing a song called Slow Ride by Fog Hat. And what happens if you don't play the buttons at the right time is that the crowd starts to boo. And uh, eventually they boo louder and louder. And eventually one of the least motivating things in all of video games comes up it says failed in, in the screen failed um uh. I, I gave up and then my wife played rock band which is a very similar game uh with some friends while she was on vacation she got really excited about it so i brought out guitar hero again and she was able to help me get through that first miserable song uh, the fog hat song and and that was like the first time in my entire life that I felt like, hey, I can do something vaguely musical. I realized it was, of course, on a plastic guitar and I wasn't really playing the notes, but still it was a step in the right direction. Um, and so I was excited about it. And I like played every day for a little while and eventually made it all the way through the easy level. And then I made it through the medium level. And at that point I said, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm spending all this time playing this game. Why don't I try a real guitar? And that mm. was the summer, summer of 2009. And uh, I've been trying to play guitar ever since. And how do you how do you feel you've progressed in trying to play guitar? Well, I think it depends on what your standard is. Compared to Jimi Hendrix and what he did in three and a half years, I'm not not very impressive. Compared to having no talent and getting kicked out of the recorder class, I think I'm doing very well. Um, I actually just played uh, some, I laid down some lead guitar on a track for a famous musician today. We'll see if he actually uses it, but at least he asked me to do it. So um, I, I feel That's at least cool. somewhat competent as, as a lead guitar player. I'm working on my rhythm still, still my weak point, but I'm getting better and better. Um, and I've played on stage as part of the book tour with a lot of uh, pretty well-known musicians uh, and and uh, I've really had a good time. So when you were younger learning recorder it was probably not that you couldn't learn recorder it was that you didn't have a teacher who was patient enough with you. That's what right the teacher think, failed quickly. Yeah what do you think other than maybe finding a better teacher or um, having more stick to at this point in your life, what other aspects of, of your brain um, allowed you to do this now? I think I have a lot more persistence than I did when I was 10 years old, and I think that plays in my favor. I know a lot more about music. Um, I mean, not just because of the last few or four years when I studied, but just that any adult who listens to a lot of music, which I always have, so starts to soak things up and has a better understanding of music. So I think the teacher made the mistake of thinking, we're doing this triage thing. We're going to figure out who's going to play in the orchestra and who's not. Marcus clearly is not going to play in the orchestra. Let's move on to the next. And the reality Let's is... Turn them out. Turn out those musicians. That's what happened. I was triaged, you know, and I wasn't triaged in science, right? I had some mm -hmm. natural aptitude for it and I went into that. But mm -hmm. the truth is you can enjoy things even if you're not a professional. So I really love making music and I had no idea that I'd be able to do it at all because of these kinds of early experiences. Um, but as an adult... <laughs> 
um, knowing something about cognitive science, I realized that there might be a shot. One of the things that I realized from my day job where I studied language acquisition was this whole idea of a critical period where mm -hmm. you have to learn something by the time you're three or by the time you're 15, you start thinking about sex, you'll never learn anything again. That this whole idea is just not really true. There's not that much data that supports it. Um, we know, for example, that there are people that learn second languages as adults and did just fine. And we know from animal studies that young animals do better on some things than older animals. But if the older animals take it incrementally and step by step, they can often do the same things as the young animals. So knowing this about critical periods made me think maybe I have a chance to do this. Yeah. So with the with the brain and what you what you know about the brain, um, we know that as as we get older, people talk about our uh, our neural pathways becoming more defined or more or less plastic um mm -hmm. do you think how much of a role do you think that plays that you have these just pathways that become set how much of a role there, does that play in in the ability to learn as an adult so there's probably some physical constraints that make it a little bit harder for adults to learn but i think they're relatively modest um i think that uh, how do i want to put this i, I think that adults um have a lot of habits that they have to overcome. So that's one of the things that's a challenge for adults. So if you know one language already and the subject comes at the beginning of the sentence and now you have to switch it to the end of the sentence, then you have a habit to overcome and that's a liability relative to a child. So habits are one of the, you know, the, the most difficult things that makes it one of the most difficult things in learning anything is overcoming bad habits and adults often have ha habits that run contrary to what they want to learn if they want to learn something new. There's a little bit of data about some modest um, decline in, in plasticity and, and the older you get the more of that there is but it's not an open and shut like on and off kind of thing. It's more like a dimmer switch that's gradually uh, turning down. What is the state of research right now on on adult learning? Uh, as far as uh, as far as I've seen, there's a lot of developmental cognitive research. We want to know how kids learn and the, the all about the plasticity of the, of, of the brain and how uh, information is soaked up during these critical critical periods you're talking about, Was versus it? like experts. You know, there's a lot of research on people who really know how to do things, like Jimi Hendrix or um, you know other other aficionados well so i guess there are two different questions there one one is what is the difference if anything between kids and adults and another thing mm -hmm. i would say about that is if you go to the developmental psychology literature you can find hundreds of studies where they compare kids and adults and almost everything the adults are actually better so usually what you find is like adults are better than 10 year olds 10 year olds are better than 7 year olds are better than 5 year olds are better than 3 year olds so adults are actually pretty good at learning most things what they don't have is the stick to that that a kid who's obsessed does and the free time that a kid mm -hmm. who's obsessed does so i think free free time is a big Big aspect. <laughs> That's right. It, um, I think that, you know, if you have, you know, mortgages to pay or things like that, you're going to have less free time, your kids to take care of or parents to take care of. And so a 12 year old uh, or 14 year old like Jimi Hendrix, who becomes obsessed with a guitar, really doesn't have that much else to do and can do it all the time. Um, and so that's one of the advantages of kids. Now, the other question that you asked about is, well, what do experts know that kids don't? There are a million things that experts know about uh, music, or, or sorry, what, what do experts know that novices don't, whether the novices are kids or uh, whether they're adults? There, there are a million different things that people know about the subtlety, for example, of the timing of notes. So one, one of the first really cool studies of music was, I think in the 1930s, somebody looked at play, player piano transcriptions and discovered that if, if you looked at when so the player piano transcriptions are actual people who were playing, recording on a roll, and you could look at the roll. And what they found was that nobody played exactly like the sheet music. They, they varied the timing. A beginner mm -hmm. is playing things exactly like it's written on the sheet music, or at least they're trying to. Often they forget right. notes that leave things out. But in the best case, they want to play it exactly like on the sheet music. And the expert knows, for example, that the melody line should come a few milliseconds ahead of the harmony. Um, so there are a lot of little details. Um, the expert knows when to hold on a no onto a note a little bit more to get a particular emotional feel. So there are lots of things that experts know that novices don't, but those aren't necessarily about kids versus adults. Those are people that know the game versus people that haven't figured it out yet. Hmm. So uh, in, in thinking about how you were going to approach learning guitar, did you, and, and what you know about cognitive, uh, about cognition, did that mm -hmm. affect the choices you made for your training? 
Sure. What, one way, for example, is that I know a lot about habituation and motivation. So we do things over and over, we get bored. And the biggest challenge we have in learning something complicated like a musical instrument is staying on task, is, is really practicing long enough. And so mm. one of the things that I started doing pretty early on was playing with a drum machine and varying the rhythms that I was playing fairly often, at least every day, maybe several times in a session. So I was trying to, um, if you remember my uh, Kluge book, I was trying to kind of outwit myself. I was trying to figure mm -hmm. out you know, where my brain is going to get off the track. People talk about the weakness of the will. That's one of the things mm -hmm. that's a challenge in, in learning a new skill is, is that people don't keep going at it. So um, I sort of tried to reverse engineer my own mind and figure out <laughs> um, what things I might do to keep myself going. And what kind of things did you have to do to keep yourself going? And, and now that you are proficient, have those things changed? Uh, well, I, I'll, let me take the second part first. I wouldn't say I'm proficient yet. I'd say I'm a hell of a lot better than when I started. Okay. Um, but uh, the more I know about music, the more I realize what I don't know. So mm -hmm. there's a huge range of things yet to learn. What, one of the things that was interesting about the book was I got to interview famous musicians like Pat Metheny, the great jazz guitarist. And even people like Pat are still learning things. And he's been playing professionally for like 40 years. And he still keeps a diary after every performance. Um, like this work, this didn't, I should try this other course. So I think the process of learning music is kind of a never ending and, and for some people anyway, a fun game. Um, like science, you know, in science, there's always something new to discover. And the same thing is true in music. Um, I'm at a lower degree in, in music than I'm in science. So in science, I'm trying to find things that are new to the whole field. And in music, I'm just trying to find things that are new for me. But mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the process is you're constantly uh, learning new things. So process, how did you, what did you do to, uh, to trick your brain to get you, were you the 15 minutes a day kind of training or what kind of training start, regime? When I started, I actually um, basically did immersion. I mean, I can't do that every day, but I started at the end of a summer when I wasn't teaching. And so I had a couple of weeks mm -hmm. where I basically practiced eight hours a day um, on the theory that kids learn foreign languages by being immersed in those languages. And an adult learning a musical instrument is sort of the same concept. Um, since then, I haven't always had as much spare time, but I try to practice at least 20 minutes every day and ideally like an hour a day. Um, one, one of the things that I, I've written about is that I got myself a travel guitar because I'm on on the road a lot giving lectures and so forth and so you don't want to just stop because you're on the road you you want to find ways to keep practicing every day that's certainly right. absolutely critical another thing that's absolutely critical is targeting your own weaknesses so you can't just play the same riffs over and over again and get really good at those three riffs you're not going to become a good musician if you, you don't extend out to other kinds of things um and i realized very obviously that, that my biggest problem was keeping time and, and and rhythm and so that's what i spent most of my focus on target your weaknesses in order to get better was that was the process fun uh, mostly. I mean, there's some, you know, scary moments when you sit there and you think, why am I doing this when I'm not that good at it? But I'd say 90% of the time it's fun. Like, uh, for example, now that I can jam along with a backing track or sometimes with an actual band, that that feeling of basically flow, which Chicks and Me I call is flow, um, of, of being in the moment, losing track of anything else that you're doing mm -hmm. and just, just really being there is a fabulous feeling. So that, that's part of what keeps me going. How long did it take before you were able to hit like your first moment of flow? Not that long, a couple months or something like that. Um, hmm. You know, I do more and more complicated things, but one of the major things I discovered was the A minor pentatonic scale, which I discovered at about two weeks into my um, practice. And, and what's beautiful about it is you have this set of notes and they fit together in pretty much any order. There's all kinds of things you can learn about phrasing those notes and timing and so forth. But the notes sound good together. And once you know that, you can start making up music. And once you can start making up music, I think you, you have a chance uh, to feel that flow state. In terms of learning music, how different what is it from learning language? It's a good question. I think there's more innate basis for language. So I think Chomsky and Pinker are right that there's probably machinery in the brain that's specially dedicated to language. I don't think that language only depends on that machinery. I think a lot of what allows us to learn language is sort of general cognitive machinery that's shared with any skill. But there are probably some special things that get human beings started on language that don't, for example, get chimpanzees started on it. But mm -hmm. language or music, either way, you're talking about a skill that requires you to take small pieces 
pieces and put them together into larger elements. So whether you're talking about putting words into sentences or putting motifs into songs, a lot of what's going on is you're, you're taking small elements and making bigger things out of them. And you have a huge demand on memory in both cases. So you have to remember all the words or you have to remember the notes and, and the scales and so forth. So they're both very demanding skills to acquire. But I'm not sure that music is innate. So a lot of people think that music is something that's built into the brain that was specifically evolved. And I think that's probably true for songbirds. So songbirds in the first 90 days of life master a song. But it takes right. human kids a few years to really master um, even some of the most basic musical concepts. So my guess is that for humans, music is actually an invented technology. It's, it's a cultural thing that's passed along and developed. Um, I always think of like Steve Jobs, you know, the way he, he developed the iPhone, right? The iPhone is not something that's built into the mind, how to use it or what it is or anything like that. It's not the product of natural selection. Um, it's the product of really good cultural engineering. And I think music is the same way. Over time, musicians have worked out things like harmony. They've uh, developed things like the 12-bar blues format, electric guitars, and so forth. And there's an accumulation of kind of tricks of how to make music uh, better and better. But I'm not sure it's actually built into the mind. So it's a skill that you learn, like reading. Language might be different. So every Everybody learns to talk, but not everybody learns to read and not everybody learns music. Yeah. And I, I guess at, the, at, at this, there's a difference between appreciating music and listening to music versus learning music so that you can produce it. That's right. So listening is easier, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and there, But there are lots of things that adults know about music that kids aren't born knowing. So for example, <laughs> adults know that if you have a melody, that it has to come back to the home base, basically. We call that re resolution in music theory. Um, you have to come back to the tonic. And kids don't necessarily know that. I've been doing some experimental work, and it's not clear that your average four-year-old really knows that a song has to come back to a particular place to end. Um, another example is that adults know that other things being equal, major chords are happier and minor chords are sadder. Now, that's not true in every song, but it's, it's a kind of um, starting generalization. And kids don't seem to know that early on. So a lot of things, even about listening to music, that seem to develop over time. Yeah, well, you'd think with minor chords, um, in uh, Asian cultures, they use a lot more minor notes. They have a different, a different uh, scale that, they, right. that so, they use. And so it's a, the, the way that they listen to sounds would be different as well. So, I mean, you have to learn the scale of your particular mm -hmm. uh, culture, just like you have to learn the language of your particular culture. So there's some things about music that have to be learned that can't possibly be innate. And then there are some things you might have thought were innate, like the idea that minor chords are sad. They probably actually aren't. And when people try to find what's mm -hmm. universal about music, they're, they're hard pressed to do it. So people say, for example, pitch is uh, uh, you know, innate to music, but there are lots of uh, cultures where percussion is the thing and pitch is not really that important. And a lot of music has a very regular pulse, but there are things like, um, I don't know how to say the word, recitative, uh, that are sort of timed to language rather than to a regular pulse. So it's not clear that there's that much that's really universal about language. It's clearly something we can naturally acquire, but we can naturally gravitate towards movies. So there's nothing evolved and innate about liking movies, but it's just something that we can learn to do and really enjoy. Uh, are there any studies that you know of that um, that look at musical ability in people who uh, did not learn to speak language? I don't know that um, that sample set of people is probably very small, but yeah, it's very very small. I mean, there's some people with specific language impairment. Um, yeah. The closest I can think of is that there are people with Williams syndrome that have some limitations on their language, although their language is pretty good relative to their visual perception, for example. Um, and there are some people with Williams syndrome that are very good at music, but you have to distinguish whether that's a natural aptitude for making music. Maybe it's a natural love of listening to music, um, and a lot of practice. I think is part of what's going on there. Yeah, it would just be interesting because you I, uh, you mentioned the critical periods earlier, and with language, there is a critical period where after a certain point, a child is not going to learn. The data on that are not nearly as strong as people think. So there was some. Oh. Uh, studies that really originally seem to suggest there's like a clear demarcation at um, uh, adolescence, basically, that you kind of you were fine, you were fine, and then you started thinking about sex and you were done for. And <laughs> 
uh, if you actually look at the data, someone did a study over several million uh, census uh, takers. Uh, it looks like there's just a gradual fall off. There's no like you know moment at which it all disappears. So I'm not convinced even with language, which is the kind of canonical case of of a critical period, that it, that it's really there. That there's really like a decisive moment as opposed to just a gradual accumulation of habits that are difficult to overcome, plus a gradual um, increase in responsibilities that gives you less free time to dedicate to something. Yeah, unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, protocols for experimentation on humans <laughs> that wouldn't allow it, <laughs> make it That's right. a little to do immoral the perfect... to do the, ex the perfect experiment to find out. <laughs> That's right. The perfect experiment would, would, you know, withhold language until a certain period or control mm -hmm. exactly how many hours and so forth, um, which is part of <coughs> why in, in Guitar Zero, I looked at the animal literature um, where people can actually do systematic studies. So you can teach a barn owl to remap the video visual uh, input to the auditory input. Um, you put a prism on its eyes. And these famous studies show that young barn owls can adapt to a 23 degree distortion. So you shift the whole uh, world over and the young owl can do it and the old owl can't. And so that's one of the, the most common pieces people cite uh, for critical periods. But it turns out you can get the older owls to do the same thing if you just break it into smaller pieces. So you have three degrees one day, five degrees the next day, eight degrees the, the next and so forth. And the adults can do it too. So it's, it's just a matter of easing them in. There's also another cool study Study that shows that if they're um, something like uh, predators involved, hawks or something like that, then they sort themselves out eventually. I think, yeah, I think that is really fascinating in the the sense that for years and years, at first it was okay, people don't grow any new neurons as adults, and then the Which literature is not true. Yeah, that's not true. It's a, that's suggested to be false. And the other idea is that as an adult, your brain becomes more and more set in its ways and that you're not going to be able to learn things as easily. But I mean, people learn things all the time. You learn new bus routes, you uh, adapt to new situations. So there's got to be some mechanism within the brain that allows adaptation to take place. That's Maybe right. I mean, not as rapidly Mem as memory the doesn't adults. disappear. It gets a little bit, you know, weaker over time, but the, the, the mechanisms of, of memory last throughout life. And we can learn new things. I think it's a myth that, that adults can't learn new things. I don't, I don't think the data for, for that view are actually that strong. Yeah. And in, this, in the sense of the aging brain, not just the old, adult brain, but the aging brain, um, as you get even older and uh, some individuals experience things like dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, and people talk about activities to strengthen your brain, to make the likelihood of these things less. Um, what is the what is the evidence at this point in time? How solid is that? I, I think it's suggestive, but not decisive is probably. Um, I mean, I don't fully follow that literature, but my, that's been my impression over the years is that it, it, doing things like crossword puzzles might help, playing music might help. Mm -hmm. um, but something like Alzheimer's is a disease process and it, it's not clear that those things help. I, I don't think the data are 100% certain. So the guitar that you're playing is just for your just for your fun right now, but not necessarily in the hopes that it'll keep your brain strong going into the future. It, it might help, but I, I don't think there's a guarantee of it. Another reason to do it is there are studies about what makes people happy. And mm. one thing that makes them happy, obviously, is short-term pleasure, like food and sex. But another thing that makes them happy is a sense of fulfillment, of, of kind of developing new skills, of, of uh, reaching your destiny or, or what have you. And um, there's pretty good evidence that if you balance your life between these things, you're going to be happier. So music gives people a sense, and it doesn't just have to be music. It could be learning how to cook. But um, when, when you learn a new skill, that leads to a kind of lasting happiness that you don't get um, just from momentary pleasure. So let's uh, talk about the the new novel novelty aspect of of learning. Um, so music in itself, you could it, there are repetitive things you mentioned earlier. There are repetitive aspects of music, but in learning, you are in in listening to music. There it, there are things about it that are novel. That different songs give you different new experiences. Learning an mm -hmm. instrument gives you a new experience. How does novelty play into all of this? Well, I think one of the most interesting things about music um, 
is the way in which it actually gives you two different rewards at the same time. And it's hard for, for a static art to do that in the same way that a dynamic art can. So we get pleasure both from novelty that you're talking about and also actually from predictability. So it, it almost sounds like a contradiction, but we really do get rewards for both. So think about a steady drum beat, for example. Every time you anticipate the drum beat, you get a release of dopamine because your brain says, aha, I'm making correct predictions here. That's a great thing. But you also get uh, dopamine for, for genuine novelty. And so music lets you have both at the same time. So you have a steady drum beat, but you vary the lyrics each time. Or you have the same melody, um, but you change the instrumentation. So there are lots of ways in music where you can simultaneously get uh, a reward for novelty and a reward for familiarity. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why music is so compelling. How, how does novelty explain the earworm? I don't, I don't know that it can. <laughs> um, I don't know if novelty explains the earworms. I mean, it might be. I don't know if we have data on that, that the things that are most likely to be earworms um, are th things that are most novel. But I'm not sure that's actually true. Um, I actually just tweeted, I'm, I'm at Gary Marcus a few days ago. You could hunt my feed. There's a uh, woman, I can't think of her name offhand, in the UK who's just looking for a postdoc now, I believe, to um, or maybe PhD students to specifically study earworms. So I think earworms <laughs> are an understudied topic, but but if you want to go to London, uh, hunt my uh, at Gary Marcus feed and you will find someone who's looking uh, for either a graduate student or a postdoc. I can't remember which to study earworms. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know exactly what happens with earworms. I've had the new gotcha song um, somebody I used to know stuck in my head for days. Everybody has that stuck in your head, but it's partly days. that one. That one's partly frequency, so it's ubiquitous both on YouTube with that version where people are playing, um, five different people are playing one guitar, and also mm -hmm. um, what I guess is the original version, um, but, which is like on the top of the Spotify list now. So you hear it right. all the time. So that part of what contributes it to it lingering. So frequency, um, the, the sheer commonality of something probably is you know, number one in whether or not something becomes an earworm. I think that I think that's really fascinating because it's not just your earworm; it's an earworm that affects lots of other people as well. Well, because they've heard the same song. They've heard now, the what, same song. what you're hearing doesn't affect other people unless you happen to have a podcast and you make other people. Right now, everybody's going to watch you, and your earworm is going to spread across the country. Gautier, that's, how he says his name, will thank you. Gautier, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Not that he doesn't already have enough views and listens as it is. But you also, you went to a, uh, a camp, a, a summer camp to learn part of your guitar. And you're, do you, you had a band. It wasn't just to learn. I mean, the reason, the real reason I went to the camp was because the camp was a bunch of kids. They were right. uh, 11 and 12 year olds and so forth. So um, I had heard about this camp and I talked to the camp director about whether I could come visit. I kind of wrote to it for several months before I, um, I, I heard back, I guess, writing to different people anyway. So the, the director finally wrote. Uh, calls me, I guess. And, and he says, sure, you can come to the camp. You can watch the 11 year olds. And obviously there's a developmental psychologist that was really interested in the difference between kids and adults. So I wanted to go. He says, sure, you, you, you can come to the camp, but if you really want the full experience, then what you need to do is, is to play in a band. And then yeah. he paused. And then he said, and of course you need to play bass because there's never enough bass players. And at that point I'd never played bass in my life, but I learned bass so I could uh, play with the kids, which was great. So when you go to the camp, um, on the first day, you have to get in a band. And for me, it wasn't certain because I wasn't sure that um, they were going to take this, uh, you know, 38 or 39 year old guy uh, into their um, bands of 11 year olds. And so I was waiting, kind of thinking like I was on a kickball team. Pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Um, <laughs> So, so some kids were nice enough to pick me. And then the, the deal in this camp is on Monday, you start the band, you start writing a song, no covers. And by Friday, you're performing that on stage and, and the kids all bring their parents. I brought my parents too. Um, and, and so it was a very um, stressful week. It was fun, but, but a little bit scary. It was going to be my first stage performance with my mom there and, and my wife <laughs> came down from New York to see the, the event. Um, and it was, it was really terrific. I discovered that there's some things that the kids did better than me. So their fingers were faster. I think they picked up patterns a little bit faster. And there are some things I could actually do as, as, as an older gentleman. I was able to contribute to the composition of the song. I had a better sense of song structure as a whole. And so I would say that kids and adults are maybe just differently abled. Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. And uh, there is a selection on your website. There's a, an audio clip of your of 
your performance or, or was it from the performance or was it recorded after? I think it might've been recorded just before. We did it twice that day on, on the Friday of the camp. And I'm not sure whether the recording is the live version or the, the, the version we recorded earlier in the day. Um, that's the band. Um, and if you, if you can scroll down, you'll actually see something else kind of cool. Um, uh, you almost scrolled down there. There we go. Um, that, uh, is one of my bandmates older and the camp director and, and me. And we, we all just jammed together as part of my book tour. And that was really fun too. That can be a lot of fun. So that so, was the rush hour reunion. <laughs> so just for a couple of seconds, I would love to hear a little bit of your music. So if we can hit the play button on the, uh, on the audio track, we can get a couple of seconds. baseline there my, my first solo <laughs> awesome I'm not sure anyone has ever played the song and it's tired <laughs> I don't know if we'll play it in its entirety. I'd love to get back to talking with you. Um, it's looking at or thinking about how you were going to put that song together and coming the creative process of writing a song. How did that differ for you from writing a book? Um, well, it was shorter. <laughs> that was yeah. good. <laughs> one um, week go. <laughs> one week go. That's right. I don't think I could write a book that fast, although it's been done. Um well, obviously, I have more command of things like words and sentences and, and ideas than I do of musical concepts. And, and certainly um, that was kind of at the beginning of my musical career. So I wouldn't say I had mm -hmm. the tools as well under control, but I was still thinking of some of the same things. Like you want variations, um, which you didn't entirely hear since we, we cut it off. But um, uh, like at the very beginning was that piano intro that's this nice classical music piece that um, Greer was playing. Uh, and then the drums all come in in this kind of a, a aggressive, assaultive way and then the rest of the band comes in. So I was thinking about uh, things about arrangement, for example. So uh, you know, how to get everybody involved, but, but uh, keep things varied. So um, one of the kids wrote the basic riff that everything else was organized around and I tried to um, put sections together and figure out how to end it and things like that. I've often wondered how knowledge of music theory really affects um, how uh, how an instrument is played. So before you learn how to write, you learn, or as you're learning to write, you learn about sentence syntax, you learn about grammar. Um, and with music, you learn notes and you learn timing. Uh, but in the sense of theory, you don't necessarily always learn theory to be able to... Play well, that's actually parallel to language, right? I mean, you don't actually have to learn anything about syntax to learn language. So, you know, three and four year olds don't know what nouns and verbs are, at least not explicitly. They can't describe what a noun is or a verb is or what an embedded clause is, and yet they manage to learn. And there are lots of musicians that have done very well without knowing much music theory. There's a whole chapter in the book about this kind of tension. Some people have a lot of music uh, theory that's quite explicit in their brains, like Pat Metheny knows exactly what he's playing at every moment. And some people just kind of have memorized the notes and don't really understand. You can just memorize riffs and tablature if you're trying to play guitar without understanding any of what you're really playing. That makes it harder to develop something new if you if you have that superficial level, but it is possible to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so music is this really interesting thing where there's a lot of conscious knowledge. It's, it's an art form that is very well understood in a kind of mathematical level, but not every individual who makes that art form understands that mathematics. Yeah. So you don't, you don't, but understanding the mathematics can, as you said, make it a bit easier to, 
produce the novelty that people enjoy. Well, for me, the, the approach that I take, um, and not everybody takes the same approach, but for me, when I'm improvising, I'm very conscious of music theory and um, where the different notes are relating on the scale and to the tonic mm -hmm. and, and where I might be going. So um, for me, all that stuff is tremendously helpful. And I know that there are lots of jazz guitarists, for example, they're very conscious of those kinds of things. Um, but it's interesting the way that people have developed new chord voicings, for example, in jazz without quite consciously being aware of what they were. Yeah, I, uh, I, I played clarinet when I was growing up and played it until the end of high school and then and fiddled with the guitar and piano a little bit. I can read music a little, um, but my theory is really weak. And I, I've recently been taught thinking about like, okay, maybe in my free time, I'll laugh about that a little bit. In my free time, maybe I'll get back into doing guitar. I've got a piano. Maybe I can, you know, try learning it again. But as I think about it, I just keep thinking that really understanding how to play the instruments, that knowing how the strings on the guitar relate to the keys on the piano would be so helpful. I, I find it really satisfying. So if you play guitar with something called tablature, that just sort of tells mm -hmm. you which frets to hold down, then it's kind of like paint by numbers. And if you do a paint yeah. by numbers, you don't really understand how to draw. The finished product might look nice, but you don't you haven't really learned anything about how to draw. Um, and you can't really improvise if you do that. And most of my joy in music actually comes from improvisation, um, from being able to make up my own music. So I'll, I'll play a backing track and try to find something that fits with that. Um, and I really love doing that. I don't think I could really do that if I didn't understand some of the theory. Yeah. So we're coming close to the end of the hour. What else are you working on right now? This book, you're promoting the pr promoting your book, Guitar Zero. Uh, but what else are you working on? Are you done, are you done with your sabbatical and moving forward with science? Um, I am doing some music cognition experiments. I'm looking at how children understand this idea of resolution. I'm doing some brain imaging things on music. Ooh, nice. um, I'm working with songbirds. So I'm still doing uh, quite a bit of research. I would say, to be honest, in the last uh, couple of months, I've been kind of busy with the book. Cause, um, the book has done quite well and there's been a lot of, uh, of media attention. And I've gotten a lot of emails, um, especially from older learners. So one of the things when I started the book was I thought I was kind of the only wacky person trying at the age of 40 not having played before it turns out there are lots of people in their 60s and 70s and so um that that's kept me busy uh, uh as well but um i've been doing a lot of music cognition research and and i do have another book plan but i'm not quite ready to, to say what it is oh excellent i'll be looking forward to that uh, yeah I, you, you talk about older learners there definitely are a lot my my grandfather I think when he was like 75, he decided to pick up jazz piano. That's awesome. Just, one just one person wrote to me, she gave a copy of my book to her father, who was, I think, 76. And he had been playing guitar for about three years. And he had just formed a band which with, with two of his friends who are about the same age. And they called it the Three Grandfathers. I love that. So is the, so you've had a huge response from a lot of older learners. Um, but, but, what, but what kind of... What kind of chord, not to pun, uh, do you think you are hitting with people with this book? Well, I think um, the most uh, gratifying thing is that a lot of professional musicians have really enjoyed the book. They feel like it's captured uh, their experience and that it, that it really explains what they went through as they learned about music. A lot of teachers have really enjoyed the book. And then clearly a lot of older learners have been inspired by it. Um, a lot of people have taken up instruments um, that they had maybe put down for a while. And the book really, I think, drives people uh, back to the piano or back to the guitar. I hope it also inspires people that might want to learn something else, whether it's golf or, or rock climbing or whatever it is. Um, I think the the data in the book make it clear that you can learn things, uh, new things as an adult and it can be incredibly satisfying. So I hope a lot of people will take inspiration for that, um, whether it's music or something else they want to learn. Yeah. So as Nike says, just do it. Right? Just do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the science says you can. And Gary's experience also proves that you can, that, that you can have a lot of fun doing it. And uh, yeah, I'm inspired. Just have to find more time <laughs> to be able to do stuff like this. Gary, it's been really great talking with you today. I've had a really enjoyable time. Thanks again for having me back. I really enjoyed both uh, episodes we've done together. 
Yeah, me too. Okay, so everybody out there, this is Gary Marcus we've been speaking with. And uh, for more information on the science of learning, music, language, you can uh, find more at GaryMarcus.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at Gary Marcus. And his book is Guitar Zero. And what was the subtitle? The subtitle is, hold on, I'm going to get there. I wrote it down. Guitar Zero, The New Musician and the Science of Learning. There we go. It's available on Amazon, available on Audible. It's also available uh, in physical form, probably at a bookseller near you. So I do hope that you uh, pick it up, everyone out there. That's it for the show today. Bye, Gary. Thank you once again. I'm Dr. Kiki, and this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And we will be back here next week. We're going to be speaking with Garth Sundum. Garth Sundum has written a book. He's, you know, one of my favorite science-y... Soliloquizing? Nah, science writer-y type people. He's written a book called Brain Trust, and we're going to be talking with him about what he learned from scientists and what he wrote in his book. We're going to be talking with him. You know, he's always a lot of fun. And that is next week. But in the meantime, you can follow me in my sciencey pursuits all over the web through social media. I'm Dr. Kiki on Twitter, Dr. Kiki on Facebook, Kiki Sanford on Google+. And uh, you can subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour if you just tuned in and learned about the show, you can tell your friends too. Subscribe. Go to twit.tv slash kiki. And you can subscribe. Find many ways to subscribe there. You can also watch the show on YouTube. It is on YouTube. And if this is not enough for you, you can also get more goodness of science at twist.org with my show, This Week in Science, my show with my co-host, Justin Jackson. Um... And then tomorrow, yeah, on Fridays, I also do the science chat on Justin TV and I'm starting some Google Hangout stuff. I'm doing hanging out for science. That's right. It's so much fun. I'll see you next week or tomorrow or later tonight or I'll see you later. Thanks for tuning into the Science Hour. I do really only hope that you will join me for one hour a week and I hope that this one hour makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Now for your science meditation of the week. Mi nombre es Sandra Kaufman y yo trabajo para el proyecto Maven de Goddard Space Flight Center. Maven es de una misión que estudia la atmósfera superior de Marte, el planeta rojo, la ionosfera y este, las interacciones con el sol y el viento solar. Los científicos quieren estudiar la historia de la pérdida de los gases volátiles de la atmósfera de Marte al espacio y ver cómo eso ha impactado o puede impactar la vida en Marte. Uno de los instrumentos que Goddard produce se llama ENGEMS. Va a medir la composición química de la atmósfera de Marte y el magnetómetro va a tratar de medir el campo magnético. En la historia de Marte se sabe que Marte perdió el campo magnético. No hay un campo magnético como lo hay en la Tierra. Y la atmósfera de Marte es muy escasa. Y Engels va a tratar de medir qué clase de gases, a qué medidas hay en la atmósfera. Mi trabajo es a proveer información y asesoramiento al director de proyectos en todo aspecto de la misión, ayudándolo a asegurarnos de que la misión sea completa en el tiempo que tenemos que completarla. El lanzamiento es en noviembre de 2013. Si no lanzamos, tenemos que esperar 26 meses más para poder tener otra oportunidad de lanzamiento. Mi día es bien ocupado, bien, bien ocupado. Me la paso leyendo muchas cosas, atendiendo muchas reuniones, escribiendo presentaciones, escribiendo papeles, respondiendo a correos electrónicos. Hay mucho, mucho que hacer y, y a veces no alcanzan las horas del día para hacer todo lo que hay que hacer. No hay día que yo no me levante que yo no quiera venir a trabajar. Me gusta la gente con la que trabajo, me gusta la misión, me gusta todo lo que hacemos. 
desde estudiar la tierra, estudiar el cosmos, estudiar el universo y ahora poder trabajar en una misión que va a ir a estudiar a Marte. Todas las experiencias que he tenido en la NASA han sido fabulosas y me lo llevaré conmigo todo el resto de mi vida.